Baptist Church. This is your pastor. Uh, this is being recorded right now in the building. It's 3.50 in the afternoon. I wanted to get this online as soon as I could so you guys can enjoy the Bible study uh, portion of uh, Wednesday. And uh, still praying for you folks. Uh, thank you for staying faithful. Thank you for many of you for giving me uh, notes of encouragement during this time. I'm really doing my best to try to uh, lead you folks uh, the best I can during this difficult time. I didn't take a class, like I said, in uh, Bible college and how to uh, lead the church through a glo global pandemic. So uh, we're all learning as we go. Uh, part of this, let's sing together. And I do encourage you, if you're watching this at home right now, you're, in, uh, you're sitting at your TV, sing. It's just your family. Uh, sing out and enjoy the uh, services together, and uh, we'll have a real good time with that. And uh, what was the first one, honey? 209. 209, amen. These will be linked below the video if you need the words. Yep, link below the video. We're doing all that fancy stuff. So if you need the words, and uh, that'd be good. 209. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than glows in any earthly skies. For Jesus is my light. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, where the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows a smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is music in my soul today. A carol to my King, and Jesus listening can hear the songs I cannot sing. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, where the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows a smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is gladness in my soul today, and hope and praise and love for blessings which He gives me now. For joys laid up above. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, where the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows a smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Ask that He uh, blesses our church and uh, protects us and uh, brings us back safely, hopefully real soon right into the building. Our Father, we thank you uh, for the opportunity to use uh, this technology for your honor and glory, Lord. Uh, it just doesn't feel the same not being in the building with everybody, Lord, but uh, uh, I believe that's how you led us to uh, protect ourselves. Lord, I pray that you protect each and ind every individual uh, from this specific virus, Lord, and others. Keep us uh, safe, keep us healthy. In Jesus' name, amen. One more song together. Uh, you can stand up, you can sit down at your home, do what you want to do. Amen. 56. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, he'll sing and shout the victory. 
while we walk the pilgrim pathway clouds will overspread the sky but when traveling days are over not a shadow not a sign when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see jesus we'll sing and shout the victory on that last onward to the prize before us soon his beauty will be home soon the pearly gates will open we shall tread the streets of god when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see jesus we'll sing and shout the victory Amen. Uh, thank you uh, to my wife for playing the piano uh, during this time. Uh, just a reminder to us in the building and to us at home, I have also heard from uh, Dr. John Hamblin, and we came to the mutual uh, decision to postpone the uh, revival that was supposed to be in spring. Uh, we're postponing that officially to June 28th through July 1st. So uh, go ahead and mark your uh, calendars right now. Uh, uh, we're not doing it uh, in just a couple of weeks. We're moving that back to June. Uh, so please plan on that. Pray for that and uh, plan on participating. Get your Bibles out. Get your Bibles out right now. And if you've gotten to this point of the video and realize you don't have your Bibles out, pause it. I'll not be offended. I won't even know that you did. So uh, pause the video right now. Get your Bibles and let's get ready to study uh, the church's doctrine. We've been studying doctrine here at the church and we are still uh, studying the uh, doctrine of the Godhead. And we've already covered as the church on Wednesday night the fact that he was born of a virgin. It's important to know that uh, Jesus Christ uh, didn't become a God. He always is God. And uh, we appreciate that. He became flesh, the Bible says, and he dwelt among us. Jackson is in the room. Do you realize, Jay, the Holy Spirit is a spirit, Jason. Spirit doesn't have flesh on. A spirit is like wind. It's like the Bible does describe it as wind. Wind doesn't have flesh on. If wind has flesh on, you're in a scary movie, amen? And wake back up. Jesus Christ put flesh on. And we understand that he accomplished our redemption. So we're thinking right now in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number 7 and verse number 25 he has died. Uh, we understand he, he died and he went to heaven. And what is he doing from heaven? That is the question. Hebrews uh, number, uh, chapter number 7, verse number 25. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the outermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Romans 8 says he's a mediator. He's an intercessor. You have two parties that are at odds with each other. Maybe uh, two siblings in a house or a husband or a wife or you're going down Main Street and, uh, and Wolverine and you get hit by a car and both sides are saying it's, it's your fault. No, it's your fault. An intercessor would come in and say, here are the facts. Here's what happened. Here's what I know. And Jesus interceding for us is able to constantly go to his father and say, Father, what the devil is saying about you or, or about me right now, that's true. But I'm the intercessor. I'm a mediator. I've 
I've paid for that sin. I, I, I've forgiven that sin. And we need to understand that. One uh, mediator described in Matthew uh, uh, Webster's 1828 says, One who interposes between parties at variance with a view to reconcile them. One who pleads in behalf of another. Sometimes you get fighting with each other. And the problem is both sides tend to not want to give up the fight. Jay, Ethne, imagine if you and Jackson were fighting over the last French fry tonight at supper. Well, you had it, or I had it first. No, it's mine. No, it's mine. And Eddie's saying, give up. And you say, I'll give it up, but I'm still going to be mad at him. And, J and Jackson says, I'm still going to be mad at her. That'd be ridiculous over a French fry, wouldn't it? But, Jason, a mediator means I'm going to come in and try to make both sides happy at the same time. I can't do that. I'm going to make one of you mad, or probably both of you mad, and just eat the French fry myself then, right? Yeah, but a mediator says, okay, I'm going to please you and I'm going to please you. It says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. We're seeing that. Now turn over to 1 John chapter number 2. We're going to see something else about who Jesus Christ is for us. 1 John chapter number 2, verse number 1. My little children, these things are right, right unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. One who defends, vindicates, or espouses a cause by argument. One who is friendly to an advocate for peace for the oppressed. Still thinking about Jesus Christ in, ev in heaven. You can have a friend of the court, it's called, to, called in Michigan. One on your side. Hey, I'm going to take Jason's side. I'm going to take uh, Ethne's side. I'm going to take Jay's side. I'm going to be a friend uh, of the court. I'm going to represent uh, them before the judge. I'm going to uh, advocate for peace in your life. I'm so glad that there's peace in our life. Jay, put it away. Listen. Okay. Number three in our study, thinking about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about God the Father. We've talked about God the Son. And catching us up now in the Bible study, let's end with the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Our church constitution and bylaw says this. We believe that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity who convicts the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And he is the supernatural agent in the regeneration, baptizing of believers into the body of Christ, and indwelling, uh, indwelling and sealing them under the day of redemption. We'll find some of this list in John chapter number 16. John chapter number 16. Take the time to turn there. John chapter number 16, verse 8. When he has come, talking about the Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because they go to my Father and ye see me no more. And of judgment, because of the prince of the world is judged. People have jobs. The Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, we understand God the Father has the job. He's the God over everything. They're all equal in power, but he's got the job over everything. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has the job, we understand, little Jason, of being our Savior, right? That's his job, and it's, he's the advocate. 
But the Holy Spirit living inside of you and inside of me has a specific job as well. He convicts people of sin. We know that feeling every once in a while shouldn't be daily, uh, but it, most of us, it probably is. We do something, and all of a sudden, we feel that somebody's watching us. We feel that somebody knows about it. There's nobody else in the room, nobody else in the car with you, nobody around that really even cares. You can be at a party and surrounded by, well, right now, 10 people. Huge party, because you can't be much more than that. Your party would be illegal. Don't be, have a big party at your home. Ten of your closest friends are having a party. Everybody else doesn't care what you do, so you do that thing, and all of a sudden you feel like the whole world is looking at you. That's sin. That's convicting you of sin. And also have here, it's that sin, that how else will we know of our need of God? The world has this part of the Holy Spirit in their life convicting them of sin. You are a sinner. You do need to have God of righteousness. Think about it. It's the year 20. Jesus Christ is walking the earth. You're spending time with Jesus Christ. Well, year 30, he died at 33. You know exactly what to do then, because if Jesus Christ is saying, we're not going there, we're not going there. If Jesus Christ is saying, we're not doing that while you're physically walking him with, with him on earth, you're not going to do that thing. You know what he wants to do. You know the expectations, and you're not probably going to sin very often with Jesus being right next to you at the dinner table. But he's getting ready to leave. He did leave. And he said the Holy Spirit's going to convict you of righteousness. It's going to be the same person, same attitude as me physically on the earth, walking and talking with you, saying this is where you go, this is what you do. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Well, who's the prince of this world? It's Satan. Satan someday is going to be judged. Satan is going to go to the hell that was created for him. And the Holy Spirit's job is to convict the world of judgment. The Bible says if you're not saved, you have that judgment on you. That's one of his jobs. But another one of his jobs is 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. Taking time to turn there as well. Second Timothy or Second Corinthians, excuse me. Second Corinthians chapter number three, verse number six. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. That's that leading. We need that leading. I don't just need to teach you uh, as your pastor what the Bible says. The Holy Spirit needs to be an active part of your life to know each and every day what that means to you and what that means to me. I could say, thou shalt not kill. What's that mean? Thou shalt not steal. We understand what both of those means, but does that what does that mean when I'm at work? What does that mean when I'm at home, at Walmart, at all of these different places? I understand now, Pastor, I understand what that means, but the Holy Spirit's going to knock on your heart's door and say, remember that message you heard two weeks ago? That was for you today. That's how you apply it right now. Turning over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, bond or free, and have been all made to drink of that one spiritual cup. Or into that one spirit, excuse me, for the, the body is not one member, but many. And our membership of Wolverine Baptist Church, we have many 
different personalities. We've got the quiet types. We've got the uh, not-so-quiet types. We've got the people that uh, are, are humble and maybe some people that are working on the humility. And uh, we've got all kinds of different personalities, but you realize Jesus Christ put us all together to be exactly who Wolverine Baptist Church is. Well, what, is, what if somebody else becomes a member then? They're going to fit in just fine. We need different parts of the body. Uh, even thinking about your hands, you have different parts of your fingers. You have different fingers. You have different parts of your fingers. Thinking about the, uh, I mean, rest of the parts of your body. How many toes do you have, Jackson? Do you have 10 toes? Yeah. Trying to listen to mom and Jason, you have 10 toes? You realize there's so many parts of your toes? Think about it. We're all members of, of one body. Heard many times, we aren't all the same person, but we're many. We can't all be the Sunday school teacher. We can't all be the uh, cleaner of the restrooms. We can't all be a bus driver. We, we can't all be a secretary. We can't all be a singer. But we can all be all those things together together as one body romans 8 and verse 9 another very important job of the uh, holy spirit romans 8 verse 9 but you're not in the flesh but in the spirit of so the spirit of god dwell in you now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. I've said many times, I don't go anywhere without a GPS. I walked into the church's backyard and went farther into the woods than I uh, did have ever gone the other day. And I did have my phone in my pocket just in case I got lost in the backyard. And you're laughing, but I'm dead serious. I, I do not go hardly anywhere without a GPS guiding me, telling me where to go. And that's the Holy Spirit GPS, and he wants to do that. Where do I need to go today? The Holy Spirit will tell you. When do I need to go there? We all have our schedule, but every once in a while, you're really urged in your Holy in your spirit, really urged in your life. I need to go right now to see so and so. I I need to do uh, such and such. Holy Spirit's going to tell you what to say. He promised that persecution's coming to. Christianity and it says in that time don't fret about it I'm going to teach you exactly what to say in that very moment sometimes we don't always know what to say people ask us a question and it's common I don't know right doing school today my kids are in the room what's the answer for this I don't know well you have a quiz you have to answer it I don't know what to answer dad well, Holy Spirit promised to never do that. And Ephesians chapter number one teaches us, and we've read some of the verses a different way. We're sealed until the day of redemption. Whenever I get to the word sealed, I always think to do different things. Number one, and I know this is being recorded. I think of my uh, my gra my grandmother-in-law, if I could put it that way, canned vegetable soup. Kids are pretty young. We just moved to Kalamazoo, living in a two-bedroom apartment upstairs. And she said, hey, have some of the vegetable soup, Ethne. It smelled horrible. Great grandma, grandma great, used to leave the vegetable soup, soup Jason, in the garage. But it was sealed, so it was supposed to last forever. But there's only one thing, one way you could see whether or not the seal really worked is when we opened it. The whole room smelt like five-year-old vegetable soup. It was gross. But this seal here, the, uh, the people in Rome reading this live as a first-time letter would understand, it would be a kingly seal. When a king sent a letter, he would put his seal on it and oftentimes in wax and say, the only, the only person allowed to open the seal is the person I'm sending it to. 
And that was the picture. We're sealed until the day of our redemption. The Bible says we're sealed until the Holy Spirit purchases us uh, either through death or the rapture when we're in heaven. Jesus Christ did, uh, sent that letter to himself. He can open our seal and say, hey, they're part of me. Number two, part of this, we believe that the Holy Spirit is the divine teacher who guides the believer into all truth. And we can find that thought in John chapter number 16. Stressing the folks, it's first, it's very weird to kind of teach to an empty room. My family's in the room, but you have the capability to pause. If I'm going too fast, when I say a, a passage of scripture, pause it and get there. John chapter number 16, verse 13. How be it when he the spirit of truth of God is come. He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will shew you things to come. It says he's a guide. A couple different types of leadership in the world. There's the boss that directly tells you what to do, when to do it, how to do it, in every detail. He, he's called a micromanager. Not my kind of leadership, per se. I like to even tell my kids when I was a manager at Chick-fil-A, I'd often tell the uh, people under me that I was in charge of that day, hey, I want you to do this. I want you to go take out the trash. And I assume that you knew how to take out the trash. Sometimes I was shocked. But uh, he will guide you. Holy Spirit's not going to force you. The Holy Spirit's not going to grab you by the shirt tail and say, you are coming here. You're doing this. He's not going to take care of your jaw and start talking for you. Blah, 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 blah. You're not a robot. Holy Spirit doesn't do that. He's saying, hey, I suggest that you do this. I suggest that you go here. You'd be right with God. You'd please my father if you go here. He's going to guide you into all things. That's why we have Ephesians chapter number 5, verse 18. Ephesians chapter number 5, verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Saw a video one time, great preacher, not my methodology, but actually grabbed a bottle of alcohol from the pulpit and I would never do that. Wouldn't have to, wouldn't want to support the alcohol company that way, but he did. And he took it and he started showing it around and said, everybody knows what this is. And some of the congregation would go, yeah, and then named the name of the alcohol. I wouldn't even uh, glorify Satan in saying that. But he said, everybody in your town knows when the drunk comes into town. Because your walk starts to change. If you ever been around a drunk, it's like the whole world is spinning. They don't. They can't walk straight. They can't walk as straight as they used to. They're drunk. Their talk starts changing. I've been around some people you can't even understand. What'd you say? They're drunk. Their talk has changed. Their walk changed. Their attitude has changed. Either they used to be real quiet. Now they're singing on the top of their lungs. They're drunk. The Bible comparison is be not drunk with wine. Don't do that. But be ye filled with the Spirit. If that's the comparison, should people be able to see that you're talking differently then? Yeah. Maybe you're walking differently. We sing the song and I reference it quite a bit. The place I used to go. I don't go there anymore. I'm, I'm a new person and I'm filled with the Spirit. The way you say things, the things you do say. We believe that God also, the Holy Spirit, is the bestower of spiritual gifts. Romans 12.3 For I say through the grace given to me that every man that is among you not to think of himself uh, more highly than not to think, for, but he to think sober, soberly according to the God hath dealt to every man according to the measure of faith as, the, uh, as we have many members in the 
one body, and all members have not the same office. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one member is one of another, having then uh, gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophesy, let, prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of our faith. Our ministry, let us wait on our ministering, him that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, and he that give, uh, and he that giveth, let him give it, do it with simplicity, and he that ruleth with diligence, he that sheweth mercy with cheerfulness. Many other verses there, if you want to take the time to turn it up after this study of 1 Corinthians 12, talks about gifts differing to all. Now the gift, uh, Tom, you've said in Sunday school class many times, is not the mumbo-jumbo talking in tongues. I remember for a while it being popular, if you have the gift of spirit, you're going to bark like a dog in church. And worse and worse and worse. No, even thinking about myself and my family, some maybe have a gift to be creative, like to create things. Well, learning how to create things for the Lord. If you enjoy singing, God gives you the gift of singing. Use it. Singing out for the Lord. Teachers, teach then. Ministering, minister. And it does say he, he the uh, gift of giving, gift of finances. God blessed you with a million dollars. Use it. Give it for the Lord. Do it with simplicity, it says. We believe that the sign gifts of the Holy Spirit, such as those speaking in tongues, like I've said, were healing, were temporary. Gifts were for a sign. 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. First Corinthians chapter number 14, verse 21. And the law is written with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people and yet for all that uh, all that will they not hear me saith the Lord wherefore tongues are for a sign not to them that believe but to them that believe not but prophesying serveth not them that believe not but for them that believe prophesying I believe simply talking about uh, today anyway preaching I can tell you things to come. The Bible says, Behold, your sin will find you out. There I prophesy. But speaking in tongues, when they did it first, it's very clear, and you should come to Sunday school. It was known languages. Don't believe me? Turn to Acts chapter number 1 and study it out. It says there are specific languages. And what was the sign? Well, we've studied recently on Wednesday nights that Israel had been rejected. Israel is no longer part of uh, God's uh, plan. He said, I'm going to take you out. I've grafted in the Jews and, or, in the, or the Gentiles, excuse me, and the Gentiles. How are we going to know they're being used? Well, God kind of said, hey, watch this. They're going to preach to you the gospel, and they're going to do it. You're going to, they're going to speak in their language. They're go you're going to hear in yours, and you're going to go, whoa, how are they doing that? And you're going to realize they're being used of God. First, uh, First John 5 talks about prayer. And if we ask anything according to his will, he'll do it. So I've been asked many times. I was in, in, in an interview one time for a different pastoral position. And they cornered me and said, hey, pastor, do you believe in faith healing? I said, well, do you mean healing by faith or faith healing? They said, well, tell us what you believe. And I will show you because I'm still in my mind realizing some of you are watching me on YouTube on your TV. So I want to try this. Reach your hand right now and touch mine. I'm going to magically do something. Reach out. Touch my hand. Here's what I believe in faith healing. Know what I've just given you church right now if you are obeying me? A dirty TV screen. Ha <laughs> ha, you got to go clean your TV screen now, Jason. I just made the entire church have a turdy TV just like that, aren't that? Isn't daddy magic, Jay? No, they're probably laughing at me on TV too right now, aren't they? I think they are. Yeah, no, 
If you're, Jason was just saying, if you're sharing this video, warn other people so they don't have dirty TV screens too. But no, I don't believe in that stuff. It was never like that anyway. When it says the apostles were healing people, it was their shadow or they touched them physically. It's by faith. If you call me today and say, hey, pastor, I just found out I've got an ingrown toenail. Pray for my ingrown toenail. I will. And I believe by faith God can give you the wisdom to take care of that, heal that up, and do all those things. Bible says uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10, the final thought on that was when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part is done away. Healing oftentimes is in part. Speaking in tongues was in, in, in part in times. So we have the Holy Scriptures. We have the Bible. It's perfect. We don't need the sign. No spiritual healing and signs. Note that the spiritual healings and signs today are often to lift me up. Hey, look how cool my pastor is. Watch this YouTube video. He's going to do something. He's going to give you a dirty TV screen. But that's all he's going to do. It's no healing. Speaking in tongues, oftentimes done in church to bring attention away from the preacher. Of a sudden, somebody's in the aisle rolling around speaking in tongues. It's all about them. God's not about them. Remember, church, he's about you lifting him up. I want to encourage you to continue in the Word of God, church, each and every day. I'm going to do this video again, probably just like this Sunday. Uh, I'm working with Tom Pulowski on what Sunday school is going to look like. Uh, stay faithful. If you do need me, go ahead and contact me. Haven't had a chance to tell everybody yet because we didn't have church. We do have toilet paper in the church. It was donated by uh, uh, somebody within the church. They don't want to have the attention on them. But if you are honestly saying, hey, pastor, what am I going to do? I'm out of toilet paper. Give me a call or stop by the church. Won't even question it. You can come get some toilet paper. Uh, praying for you folks. Love you guys. Stay faithful in the Lord. Thank you for uh, watching this video to this point. I'm going to pray and I'm going to end the video. And uh, you guys just have a good day. Amen. Father, thank you uh, for this time. Thank you for this technology we can use for your honor and your glory. Uh, I pray that this video is an encouragement to somebody. Uh, protect us from this virus and others. In Jesus' name, amen.